Good evening. My name is Don Thick, and I'm with the Library Telescope Task Force, and we're happy to join you once again for our monthly program on the Library Telescope. Uh, tonight's program is, is about a called a lunar program for library telescopes, and we'll talk about that just in a minute. Um, if you you may have heard our discussion last month in our last month's program about the International Library Telescope Observing Week, uh, we actually have implemented that for this year for the first time. And so we did get a few libraries uh, to implement the program. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Obviously, we're focusing on the moon this year. We were able to focus also on Saturn and Jupiter and a few more things. So we'll hopefully we, we'll be planning to do that once again next year. So if you happen to be a library, you know, check with us on the date and uh, let's all work together to make sure that we get that library telescope pointed to the moon and have a great, uh, great experience. So we've talked a little bit about uh, the fact that we do this each month. Um, we've been doing this actually for over a year or so, and we've had a lot of programs. You can see the last couple we've had. We've had one on August 18th, Library Telescope Hacks and Fixes. And that's where that's really dedicated to or working for managers who are trying to figure out how to repair a telescope or make it work just a little bit better. We have actually uh, a nice YouTube video on that. If you look at our uh, YouTube, our, our librarytelescope.org page or Facebook, uh, we've actually got YouTube uh, connections on the library telescope page, or you can go to the Facebook page and see some of the past history. These are, uh, you just hit the uh, librarytelescope.org page and look at the YouTube button at the very top right. So on August 18th, we had Library Telescopes Hacks and Fixes. On September 15th, we did a really fun program on Library tel Telescope Star Parties. And that's where we'll hold a party at a, at a library and show off how the telescope works and have their patrons learn how to use it. Tonight's program is a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's called a Lunar Program for Library Telescopes. And I've been involved with an amateur astronomer for many years. And many of the old time astronomers, they get bored with the moon. But I will tell you, if you're a new person and I'm still consider myself pretty new, I think it's just fun to look at the, at the, at the moon. There's so much to see. There's so many different objects. And that's what uh, Rocky Togni tonight of the Central Arkansas Astronomical Society will be talking about. He'll be talking about things you can do on the, to look at on the moon. And I will say, if I have a star party at a library and I have a hundred people, I will get 95 wows. And, and the rest of them are still pretty good experiences. They just love to look at the moon. There's nothing really much more fun. And of course, that's the closest uh, celestial object. So, so once again, all these programs will be on the librarytelescope.org page. Check the YouTube button at the top. Uh, we'll get this program recorded and out there within the next couple of days. So if you have some friends that missed it, you can actually watch it there. So uh, if you're on Zoom, uh, you can post questions to the Zoom uh, Q&A box. If you're on Facebook, you can post questions to the Facebook page. We'll be watching that and uh, we'll, we'll feed the questions to our presenter in a very short time. So Rocky, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and if you wanna bring up your page and we'll get this thing underway. There it is. There you go. Okay, Perfect. so it looks, it looks good. Thanks. Um, so, lunar program for library telescope or binoculars because um, we're going to talk, talk. We're going to be looking at the moon, like Don said, is a wow. But actually, learning more about it is is even more interesting, and that's what that's what this talk is going to be about: is learning learning uh, how to enjoy the moon and observe the moon a little to make it more interesting. So, I want to learn a lot about the moon, our nearest neighbor, before going out with your scope or binoculars. And let's start out just by talking a little bit about the moon. Uh, the, the moon is very important to 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 Earth, actually. Uh, it is a stabilizing influence on the Earth, and it has been long rec recognized as a stabilizer of the Earth's orbit. Without it, uh, the uh, the tilt of the Earth could vary up to 85 degrees over over a couple of million years or something like that. But just think, uh, the if that was uh, true, then the North Poles would be the, on the equator. Uh, so you can think how that would uh, change the anatomy of the Earth. So it, it's very important that we that we have the moon for that stability. Another thing that the moon uh, 
is in everyday life, especially if you're near the ocean, is with the tides. Um, and they're, they're very interesting to, to study on their own. And of course, uh, it gives us light at night, which has a lot to do with uh, uh, animal and insect cycles and, and, and all the other uh, human cycles. Uh, so, um, and as far as we go, uh, of course, the moon is short month comes from the word moon. So the moon is, uh, is, is what the calendar was made from originally. And uh, uh, the seasons, different seasons in, in, the, in the calendar, astronomy and science, and then of course the moon and romance and literature. Is, there's a lot that's very interesting and uh, enjoyable to read. I went out this evening uh, before coming in here and the full moon was just coming up over the horizon and it was pretty spectacular right when it's on the horizon. So I want to talk a little bit about the moon's origins. Uh, the moon formed about four, four and a half billion years ago. And they thought for a long time it was a captured moon, like all the other moons in the uh, solar system. But um, after the uh, Apollo missions, they felt like the uh, Mars-sized object, and they named it, call it Thea, actually crashed into the Earth. And this is in the early days, like four point, it was 4.55, like 4.5 billion years ago. Um, and then it kind of formed a ring, uh, a creation ring around the planet, kind of like, and something similar might be Saturn's rings now. And uh, uh, then that, that ring gradually coalesced and uh, coalesced into the moon. Uh, and the reason they think that, that that theory is, is true is because when they brought back all the rocks from the Apollo mission, they uh, found how similar they were to Earth's rocks. And they were able to explain a lot of things uh, using this theory. So uh, that's why they've adopted this theory as the theory uh, uh, of how the Earth, how the moon was formed. So our, our moon is a natural satellite. It's one of more than 96 moons in the solar system. And it's the only moon of any planet that is the largest moon relative to planet size. You might even consider us a double planet instead of a, a planet and the moon. Uh, and it is the fifth largest moon in the solar system. It's about uh, 240,000 miles away from Earth. And, uh, uh, and it's about uh, 2,155 miles in diameter, which is about a fourth of the size of Earth's diameter. <clears throat> the moon's surface is pretty stark. Uh, no atmosphere, no liquid water. It has temperatures of uh, 265 degrees Fahrenheit in the daytime and minus 310 degrees Fahrenheit at night. And it has about one sixth the Earth's gravity. Uh, talk about talking about the features that you see on the moon and and the seas or the merrier or something you can see naked eye. It's the dark areas on the moon. Originally thought to be seas by the early astronomers. What they are is large uh, uh, basins where uh, where large objects have impacted the moon. And, and like you can see this one on the right, that's the mirror embryum right here. You can see my pointer. And so a large object came in and made mirror embryum somewhere between 4.55 billion years ago and 3.9 billion years ago. And, uh, uh, and then it was just a hole like any crater. But, but then, uh, a little later, about 3.9 billion years ago, lava started flowing, uh, flowing uh, up from the inside of the moon into, into this basin and, and created a huge lava basin there. And it actually overran uh, whatever little craters and stuff there was in there. A lot of times you can see ghost craters in this. Um, but that's how the that, how the seas were formed. They were basically large basins that were backfilled with lava from the inside of the moon, and mostly basalt rock, which is a molten, uh, a thin lava rock. 
So craters are another feature, and uh, uh, that's that's kind of what we hear the most about is craters on the moon. They're uh, up to 2,500 kilometers across. Most of those get filled have been filled with lava. Uh, Clavius, one of the bigger craters on the moon, uh, that's not a that's not a sea or a mare, is a uh, 230 kilometers. Uh, something interesting that I failed to mention on the uh, mare one is that our side of the moon is the only one that has seas. The other side of the moon uh, has uh, might have just a tiny bit of a uh, uh, lava that's been drawn out from on that side, but almost all all the lava is on our side, <clears throat> and that's because of the gravitational. Uh, the Earth and the Moon are locked in in. Uh, locked together. One side faces the earth all the time, so lava is pulled out that way. Okay, so uh, most craters are formed by a meteorite or a large object impacting on the moon. A lot of them are, uh, uh, you know, they range from, you know, tiny up to uh, 100 to 200 km kilometers across. Um, and a few are, are, were formed by volcanic action inside the moon, but most of them are from uh, impact. Another feature is mountains, and those mountains are uh, were formed when the Mary were formed when the uh, when the uh, large object crashed. I'm gonna go back a couple of slides because okay, see, Mary Embryum pushed up these mountains right here. Uh, when the object came in, it pushed up this these mountains, which are named the Apennine Mountains, and these are the Caucasus Mountains. They're named after Earth Mountains. Um, but uh, that's how those mountains were formed. Was when the impact was made, it pushed pushed material up to form the mountains. On on Earth, we have uh, we have a lot of weathering. We have uh, <clears throat> wind and rain and uh, freezing and, and unfreezing of water that changes our landscape continuously. On the moon, there's there's no atmosphere and nothing to change the landscape hardly. Uh, so when there's a new crater like this, like this crater right here, which is named Tycho, uh, it blasts material out across the moon. And uh, and so for the new craters, and by new craters, I mean about two, less than 2 billion years old, you can still see these, uh, these rays coming out of some of them. And uh, gradually those rays are, are weathered down by micrometeorite uh, impacts and uh, just weathering. Uh, but it's really neat to look at the moon and, and know that uh, when you see a bright spot, you're seeing a young crater. And, and we'll see a little, few, a little bit more of that as we go through. Movements of the moon. The moon rises in the east and sets in the west. Uh, just like the sun, it, it rises and sets about 50 minutes later each day. Uh, Rotation, the, the moon turns on its axis every 27 and a third days, and we always see the same side of the moon. And a side rail month is, 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 is when the moon rotates one time completely. And so it, it rotates around this circle and comes back to the same spot. And so that would be the side rail month, 27.32 days. But actually, the Earth is moving while while that moon is moving around. So to go from new moon to new moon or full moon to full moon is 29 and a half days. So those are two different uh, uh, things. So the actual rotation is 27.3 days. But what we observe is the uh, synodic month, which is 29 and a half days. And we get, and this is a, phases of the moon uh, for a whole month. Um, I think that's right. Maybe minus a few days at the front and the back. But anyway, the moonlight uh, moonlight is reflected sunlight. The moonlight has a, reflects about 7% of the light that hits it. And uh, as on average, um, half the moon's surface is always lit, unless of course you've got an eclipse. 
but there's always half of it lit, even when we can't see it. And we'll show you that in a minute. Uh, but from Earth, we, we're observing different, different, uh, different air, you know, the, the light and dark of the moon is, uh, um, we see different amounts of it on the surface and we call that phases. <clears throat> and the way phases work is sunlight's coming from the right, right hand side and from Earth, when, when uh, the moon is between us and the sun, and that doesn't mean directly in between, uh, they're only directly in between when there's an eclipse. Uh, the rest of the time, the, there's enough tilt in the orbit that they, they don't uh, go in between, but they're close enough that, it, that you can't see the, the other side of the moon. See the sun shining on this, and uh, so at day, in the daytime, the, the moon's up all day, and you can't see it. But then as it, as it moves on around, uh, we start to be able to see the crescent moon and then the half moon, the gibbous moon, full. And then it starts back to waning gibbous, third quarter, waning crescent, and back to the new moon. So uh, that's how the phases work. I wanted to uh, stop sharing and, and reshare re something different. Um, and I'm going to go back to uh, a few hours. This is Stellarium, and it's a free program that's just really, uh, uh, really a great program to start playing with. And what I've got it set on is is October sixth, which is the date of the new moon. And if you've been out lately, you've seen this view right here. We've got Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. And now I'm going to go forward one day. There's two days. So the eighth, you can start seeing the moon come up. And then as it goes, it goes on past Venus. That's probably a satellite right there coming through. Can you see that okay, Don? Yes, I can. Thanks. Okay, good. Um, and uh, I can also zoom in and show you the, the phase of the moon at that point. And we'll just keep on going. Oops, I went too far. Okay, so you can see every day it's moving uh, farther along the ecliptic. And then on, uh, on October 13th, you can see down here in the lower right-hand corner, it's gonna pass Saturn. And then the next day it'll pass Jupiter then come on over and we'll look at see what phase it is now. See, now it's a gibbous phase, a large gibbous phase. So anyway, those are just some things you can do with Stellarium. Is, uh, and, and I enjoy going out and watching the moon every night uh, to see if, uh, to watch the movements of the moon. And I, I'm going to recommend that too here in a second. Okay. Okay, now let's talk about eclipses just a minute. Um, a lunar eclipse is when uh, the uh, Earth comes between the sun and the moon. And so it, it occurs during a full moon and, um, and there's a cycle, a cycle to it. But uh, anyway, you can see uh, when the when the moon is goes directly behind it, it's in the umbra, and then uh, the moon kind of fades out in the penumbra. Um, but lunar eclipses are nice because uh, a lot of times they turn red. Uh, they're several a year, but they're not always in uh, you know visible from from the United States or from where you live. A uh, few that are coming up is uh, November 18th to 19th this year. There's a partial lunar eclipse, and I'm talking about Little Rock. Uh, this is a great site. You might want to write it down. It's www.timeanddate.com. And about anything you, you want to know about uh, sunrise, sunsets, 
moonrise, moonsets, uh, eclipses you can find on this site. And it gives some really nice uh, um, maps. And there's another uh, a partial lunar, let's see. Here you go. There, and there's a total lunar eclipse next year, May 15th, 16th, uh, that may be visible where you are. You'll just have to look up. It is visible where I am, which is Little Rock. And you can, I think this pink is where it's, where it's going to be total. So it's total in the Eastern United States. Then a solar eclipse is, <clears throat> is when the uh, moon moves between the sun and the earth. One, one thing that's kind of, uh, that's really neat is the sun and the moon are almost the exact same size in the sky. So, uh, so that's why the moon can eclipse the sun uh, is for a total eclipse is because they're so close in size. And we'll t talk, there's a, so the moon moves between the earth and the sun. Um, so it casts a shadow and hopefully some of you got to see the one in, uh, in 2017, but if you didn't, there's one coming up in 2024 that's visible here, in, here where I am in Arkansas and Missouri, Texas, uh, and a lot of other places up and down. Up and, I'll show you a map here in a second. Um, there's three types of solar eclipses. There's partial, and then there's annular and total. Annular is when the moon is is far is in its apogee, which means it's farther away from Earth. The moon moon doesn't have a round orbit; it has an elliptical orbit. So when it's farther away, it's the, the apogee, and the total moon total is when the moon is is uh, uh, near nearest Earth. So we've got a total eclipse coming up. Uh, oh, this is a this is a partial eclipse in uh, 2023. So it's a warm up. I think it's actually an annular. It's an annular eclipse in 2023, which would definitely be worth going to see if you want to get down there to Texas or uh, where does it go through Colorado? Out through that way. And here's the one for 2020, April 28, 20, and these are, these are all time and date uh, maps. And you can plug in your location. and It'll give you all the information about your location. Um, so that'll be uh, April 8, 2024. And the tides are kind of neat. Uh, they're caused by the pull of the moon's gravity on the Earth. Uh, high tide is the side facing the moon and the side away from the moon. And low tide is on the sides uh, of the Earth, wherever the moon is. So, uh, so the tides are an uh, interesting thing that, that help control a lot of things on Earth. And exploring the moon, I just wanted to talk, touch on that because uh, we, of course, we just went through our 50th anniversary of the of the moon. Actually, we're still going through it because. Uh, there's still some Apollo missions that were less than 50 years ago, uh, but they brought back 842 pounds of, war, of rock and 12 Americans have walked on the moon. Now I want to talk about a, a method to become familiar, familiar with the moon. Um, become, become familiar with the, mainly the seas and significant craters before going out. Uh, I like to talk about seeing the lady in the moon, and I'm going to show you that next, and then do a two-week study from new moon to full moon, checking off the 20 boxes on the check seat as you see them. And I don't know. I hope you all can see the lady in the moon here. I see her every time I look at the moon. <clears throat> and here's her, uh, here's her hair. And here's her eye and her mouth, her nose, her chin, a brooch. So here's her face right here. And kind of here's a stylized thing. And another one, and, and that's a good, learning these these three uh, mares, Serenitatis, Tranquilitatis, Fecunditatis, and then Chrysium here. And that helps you learn those three. And that helps you find your way around the moon. And another one is the rabbit in the moon. And, and see the rabbit, here's the ears coming back. Here's his eye and his, 
kind of legs. You can kind of see how it's made out right here. So anyway, those are two pretty neat little things in the moon. <clears throat> Here's a little map you can download from Sky and Telescope. It's a free free thing and uh, printed out. It's got all the objects that, that, that I have on a checklist for you. And here's a checklist, and it starts with figure with the new moon, doing the new moon date, uh, then finding the, the first moon, the first moon you can see, which is normally a small crescent moon, uh, and seeing if you can see the Earth shine. Normally you can actually for the first three or four, three days of the moon anyway. And uh, a lot of people find sport in uh, seeing how young a moon or how old a moon they can see. So that's a that's a little adventure right there and all these objects are visible with binoculars or your library telescope and i'll show, show you a little bit more on those so the program is you start or restart at a new moon note the date and time uh see which night i already talked about that uh, features are best seen near the terminator every night presents new features on the second or third night after new moon, you look for Chrysium and Langrenus. As you can see, you'll, when you do it, you, when you start looking at the map and memorizing the map a little bit, just like you were if you're going on a trip or we're going on a trip or something, uh, then every night go out for a few minutes and, and re-look at the moon. It's so easy with library telescope or binoculars, either one. I've been, I've been doing it several, quite a few nights in the last few weeks. And it's just, I can just go out and set up and be looking at the moon in, in a few minutes. And it's pretty spectacular through a library telescope. Um, continue to look at it through full moon and check off the features as you see them. And then if you see other features that you like, uh, uh, try to figure out what they are. A lot of them will be on that map, but some of them may, you may have to dig a little deeper. Observing on the Terminator is, uh, where you want to observe most of the time. That's where you see the most features. It's just like in uh, uh, here on Earth at sunset, you get long shadows. Well, at sunrise or sunset on the moon, you get long shadows. So watching the term, uh, sunrise along the Terminator, see like on, this is the uh, crater Plato. And uh, it's got, it's lava filled as you can see, but you can see the outline of the, uh, uh, the rim and the peaks on the rim and how jagged the rim is by looking at those shadows. Observe away from the Terminator, you can see the bright areas of the moon and the dark areas of the moon. And so on this, if you can see my thing, we can see uh, Aristarchus, this little bitty crater right here uh, that's visible about full, just before full moon, um, that's the brightest spot on the moon. Then you've got one of the most spectacular craters on the moon, Copernicus, that's a new new crater, Kepler, and then of course Tycho up here that all these rays radiate from, a lot of these rays radiate from. And you can see other bright spots, but those are those are four that are on the list. <clears throat> for, on, for example, on the seventh, the seventh quarter, uh, looking along the Terminator, you can see that there's more de a lot more detail in the crater, in that crater, than there is these craters, any craters over here, especially. But uh, here's a Plato, and then here's the trio of Archimedes, uh, Autoclus, and I forget the third one's name. Uh, the Apennine Mountains right here that we talked about being on Mare Imbrium. Uh, Apollo 15 was right in this area of the Apennine Mountains. Uh, Ptolemy, this, this is a really pretty trio of craters. All three of them different because they're from different epochs of time. And then uh, it's kind of hard to pick out, but uh, Tycho, I think, is, uh, is this crater right here. And, and it's really easy to pick out at high sun but when it's on the Terminator, it's uh, it's 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 got a lot of detail. It's really a pretty crater. And then here's Clavius. So anyway, you can pick out your uh, thing. And I think uh, one of my references uh, gives you will give you that if you do the printout. Okay, just uh, Apollo 11. Here's the stamp. First step on the moon in Mare Tranquilitatis. Once you do this, you'll know where that is. 
uh, Apollo 15, the first lunar rover, which was huge. Lunar rover helped, uh, they were able to get a lot farther on the moon and they did that 15, 16, and 17. And they uh, were able to um, bring back a lot of different geological things that they wouldn't have been able to bring back because of that. Uh, near Hadley Rill in the Apennine Mountains. When will we return? It sounds more and more like we're, we're getting ready to return. So you want to know more about the moon. Uh, so it will be more interesting to you and those that you inspire. And if you're interested, uh, you can complete that little checklist and there's directions on the little handout that we gave you uh, to get a, a, a certificate of completion mailed to you. So anyway, that completes my presentation. Well, thank you, Rocky. So you want to, feel, want to unshare the screen. I did uh, post your PDF to both Facebook and Zooms for anyone that would like to download it. And so you can, you should be able to pull that up and just download it. So we, uh, we're running just a little short of time, but if there's any questions that you have, just post them out there on Facebook. We'll try to get Rocky to answer those for you. I will say the moon is so much fun. Let me see. We've got, uh, we got a lot of the hearts and love going up here, Rocky. So uh, uh, people are liking what you're talking about or liking the moon. It's just so much fun to go out and take a look at that. In fact, sometimes, as you know, even in a library telescope, when it's a full moon, it can be almost so bright that you actually almost have to, to dim it down somehow by putting a, either some kind of filter on it or, or stopping down the telescope where it's a little bit smaller hole. In fact, so, go out tonight. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. It is gorgeous tonight if, you, if you've got the weather for it. A pair yeah. of binoculars would be great, but if not, you can still see the dark areas and maybe some of the bright areas with your naked eye. Yeah. So one of the tricks that Rocky and I were talking about before we started tonight was, uh, you know, when is the moon really up early in the evening? So if you take a new moon or maybe you could explain it, Rocky, you can explain it better than I can. So if you have it, when do you start to, to, to be able to look at it in the evening before you go to bed, say? Well, figure out when the new moon is. And, and all you got to do is is uh, Google when the new when is the new moon and it'll okay. tell you it'll give you a date and a time and nor no, you know, the, the shortest time after new moon that you can see a moon, it, it, you know, people have seen it 12 hours, 19 hours, but that's pretty rare. Best I've ever seen is about 24 hours, and that was pretty rare. But about two days after the new moon, you should be able to see it. And then every night it'll get, get, get brighter, um, get bigger and farther along. And it's just so much fun. I mean, it's fun to me to watch it go along the, the sky and see how much it moves every night and see how it changes. So I don't see any questions, but I want you to answer a very common question that I get whenever I go out with a library telescope. When's the best time to look at the moon? So what I, what people look at the full moon and say, oh, that must be the best time. So what's your opinion? Oh, half moon to, to, to give us. Yeah. So first uh, quarter moon, basically. Maybe so a little less than first quarter up to, and up so to why about is three that? quarters. Why is that? Yeah, why is that, in your opinion? Uh, the features. And another thing is it's higher in the sky. Yeah. When it's like, a, uh, you know, five, four or five days old, it's still not real high in the sky usually. Right. Um, and But, I mean, it's fun looking at it then, too. And and you see, you see something different. Even from month to month, if you look at the same feature on the Terminator, it'll be different because the sun's at a different angle. Uh, and it's just amazing. And Yeah, and that's the common mistake that I get when I get with working with children. Uh, they tend to look at the moon for like 10 seconds and say, that's fun. What else can I look at? I said, but did you really look? Did you look yeah. at the craters and did you look at the shadows? Did you look at the mountains and the overlapping uh uh, craters, how they actually work. Did you look at the mare and how many craters are there? And what I love is the back by the fact that each each night as the shadows change, you see something different. And sometimes you might even see a lunar X or sometimes you can see a beautiful mountain one way. Then if you go to a different phase, there's a mountain the other way. So it's really, really cool to see stuff like that. Well, my All favorite right. objects is a straight wall. A straight wall. What's that? Well, there's a, there's an object, uh, and it's just after just after first quarter. First quarter, uh, it's it's actually a fault, but it it looks it looks like a, a sword, or a, 
and it, it's just pretty spectacular. <laughs> That's my yeah. favorite option. So we've got Tom Lynch on here who joins. He runs the Facebook page. Tom, you want to add anything else before we get, we sign off here? I appreciate you helping me with the Facebook and things like that. So um, what do you think of the moon? You love it? Oh, yeah. Moon is fun. Moon is uh, the easiest thing to see. And as, as Rocky said, there's so many things to see there that it's, it's really worth the effort. Uh, we did have a comment in, in the, uh, the uh, chat room here about from uh, Vivian about uh, the bottle cap trick that John Goss uh, talked about in the Astronomical League uh, in Night Sky Network. And I'm not familiar with that, but... Uh, it works. You know, <laughs> I tried. Uh, I did it. There's a play, there's a, a link here that you can go to, and it sounds interesting. Uh, yeah, it works. The president of the league. So I think it's, do you, you pick a little pinhole in it? Is that right? Yeah. 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 So, so how's that work again? Do you remember how it works? I, John explained Oh, yeah. That. It's just, you just take a bottle cap and put a little, uh, I, th I don't remember what I put. Uh, uh, I, I, it may have been an eighth, but I think it was a little bit smaller. And then you sm I smoothed off the edges, so it was smooth on both sides. And then you just look at the moon through it, and it and it it takes out a lot of the uh, brightness. Oh and yeah, glare. there you go, got it. And, right. and so then you can actually see more features on the moon. Yeah, cool. I've never done I think that. I'll go try it tonight. Oh, there you go. That's really cool. Well, <laughs> yeah. I took I took some folks out on Saturday night, uh, some high, on Sunday night, some high school students, and they were complaining how bright the moon was through a telescope. They said, "Wow, that is really bright." So don't un underestimate how much a telescope could bring in the light. So a binocular look is just gorgeous, just really, really pretty. So, all right, guys, we're going to sign off. And uh, I will, for those of you that uh, have been listening or want to share this with some friends, we will have it once again, this uh, recorded. It'll be on Facebook, of course, but for the Zoom folks, we'll have this on our YouTube account. You go to librarytelescope.org, uh, click the YouTube button. It'll be out there probably sometime later tomorrow afternoon. Rocky, I'd like to thank you for helping us out tonight and give us a presentation and Tom for uh, managing the Facebook page. So we may take a break, I think, in November, December from our monthly programs. We've been doing this for quite a while. And I think with the holidays, we're going to just take a break for a few months. But uh, we'd love to hear on Facebook or uh, other places if, or even on the library telescope uh, dot web or web page. If you've got some ideas or programs you'd like to hear about. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing those with us, and we'll try what we do. We have really a building task force, by the way. It's getting quite large, and we have a lot of great expertise. So thank you so much, and thanks for those, those of you on Facebook and Zoom that have followed us tonight, and to have a great evening.